Um, it's my pleasure to invite first Professor Kelly Chibali from the University of Cape Town to talk to us um, about his journey from Cambridge to pioneering integrated drug discovery and development in Africa. So welcome, Professor Chibali. Thank you. First of all, I, I, would, I would like to thank the, um, uh, the organizers for uh, putting together this, uh, this meeting. But also special thanks to, to David Dunn uh, and Pauline Essa, who I have been interacting with uh, directly. Thank you for inviting me and allowing me to share um, my story in the next uh, 25 minutes or so. All right, so this is the structure of my, my, my presentation. Um, um, some of these things were really, when I was invited, I was asked to, uh, to address uh, specific things. Um, and so this has uh, partly been influenced by the guidance I've received in terms of what I need to, to talk about. So I'll talk about what um, a Cambridge PhD did for me um, um, here. Um, and then I will share with you uh, how we um, really setting up and seeding uh, a research and development industry uh, in, in South Africa through, through our center which I'll come back to a little bit later. And then I will share with you uh, briefly um, what we're doing uh, to contribute to capacity building uh, in Africa. Um, and then um, I will finish off with um, uh, some thoughts uh, on how I think um, Cambridge could um, continue to support uh, researchers once they, they graduate. I think some of the points I'm, I'm going to touch on uh, were already mentioned this morning uh, by other speakers, but I'll come back to that later. Okay. So, what did a Cambridge PhD do for me? Um, I can waffle on and talk for a long time about many, many benefits, but I'd like to uh, just summarize these three things here. The first one is very high quality um, uh, training, uh, which I received here. I was here uh, down in Lensfield Road in the Department of Chemistry uh, for the period 1989 to 1992. The second benefit, um, I think, of being a Cambridge graduate is, first of all, the credibility uh, that is associated with the, uh, the Cambridge name, uh, as well as the, um, a large extensive network of alumni, uh, which really, uh, whether one likes it or not, um, does open um, uh, doors. Uh, and of course, some of those benefits um, are unquantifiable. The third benefit for me was the, the tremendous help uh, received from uh, colleagues and friends um, in the department when I, when I arrived. I was really disadvantaged uh, in the sense of coming from a background where I was not exposed to research at all. Um, and I think having um, peer scientists who really were there to support me and others, I think uh, is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, and when I realized uh, the gap between them and me, uh, I think that was actually an advantage because it really helped me to uh, realize what I had to do. Not necessarily to get to their level, uh, but to try and uh, bridge the gap. So briefly, that's what uh, Cambridge uh, did for me. Let me switch to the second part of my talk, which is um, how are we responding to some of the challenges that we have in Africa? People earlier were talking about basic research. We're talking about applied research. What I'm describing to you, or I'll be describing to you, is neither basic research or applied research. It's what we call use-inspired basic research. So when you think about Africa, I'm sure most of you, unless you're not a human being, when you think about Africa, this is what comes to your mind. <laughs> it's a big five. Um, there they are. But there's also, from a health perspective, there is also a big five. This is the so-called communicable big five. There is the non-communicable big five as well, which I'm not gonna be dealing with. So what I'm gonna share with you in the next couple of slides is our response to contribute to responding to the challenge posed by the big five. And the particular focus that we've chosen 
you have to focus on something. You have to start from somewhere. And so for us, we focused on um, looking at uh, TB, um, malaria, and much more recently, last year, a new program dealing with um, drug-resistant infections of bacterial origin with implications on addressing diarrhea diseases. That's what we've begun just more recently. But these two programs are um, a lot more mature uh, compared to the other one. All right, which then brings me to um, the steps we took to try and respond to the challenge of um, the Big Five, the communicable Big Five. But also, there was an additional challenge we had to respond to in terms of creating an environment where we can create jobs for our scientists. One of the big problems that we face in making science attractive as a career, you can do your PhD, you can do your postdoc, what next? And why should anybody study science? And for us, that was a mission. Apart from contributing knowledge, apart from contributing to providing solutions, how can we contribute to finding employment for our scientists, to make science attractive? Entrepreneurship is what I'm referring to here. So this led us to establish H3D, which is um, a University of Cape Town Drug Discovery and Development Center. The business was, was developed in 2010. 2010, if you didn't know, I'm reminding you, 2010 is the year when we hosted the Soccer World Cup. <laughs> in 2010, England failed at the final, <laughs> semi-final stage of the year. So anything you start in 2010 is a big deal because the calendar has now changed. It's before 2010 and after 2010. But we really just got going uh, in 2011 officially uh, with this drug discovery center, embedded within an academic environment. We are located, um, when we started, when I, I, in 2011, about 2011 when we started, I had, in addition to, I had my academic group, which, which is another thing that I wear. I'm, I'm an academic and I, and I train PhD students and postdocs. But when I started the center, um, I had five postdocs uh, in 2011. Uh, we've grown the center now to more than 60 staff scientists, completely focused on drug discovery uh, programs. We are in three locations across the campus. Um, uh, there's a the chemistry part, uh, which is actually, we call it the head office, because my office is there, so therefore it's a head office. Um, we have the biology group um, at the medical school uh, within um, the IDM, which is the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. And then we have uh, a pharmacology drug metabolism component uh, at the hospital, Grutzka Hospital. Uh, this is the hospital, which is very iconic. This is where Christian Barnard performed the world's first heart transplant. And we're embedded within um, this uh, building here uh, on a floor that we occupied and refurbished uh, within the hospital. All right, we have three main technology platforms. And these are really important um, to keep in mind because when you're talking about discovering a medicine, if you go to a pharmaceutical company, I had to take a sabbatical myself to go and learn about how to set up a drug discovery center. It's really about integrating multiple disciplines. And this is not even multidisciplinary, this is interdisciplinary. This is a team-based science operation requiring every discipline to participate meaningfully in the project. So we have actually uh, mirrored what you would find uh, in a pharmaceutical company or, or, or a small biotech. So we have the chemistry platform, which includes synthetic chemistry, medicinal chemistry, and what we call computer-aided uh, drug design, or, 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 or CAD. We have the biology component, again, disease biology to support the, uh, the focus areas that we work in, uh, in, in TB and malaria. Then we have a third platform, or technology platform, which is essentially a pharmacology drug metabolism of magnetic platform, where we have a suite of um, in vitro assays, uh, where this ADMI stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So all suite of assays you'll find uh, in a big pharmaceutical company that we've set up to really 
uh, front load, uh, the understanding of what the human body is likely to do to a drug before we venture into clinical development. Um, and then we have also uh, set up uh, a platform for doing rodent phomogenetics uh, as well as efficacy um, uh, and also developing several assays. A much more recent addition to this platform is this humanized mouse model of p So Plasmodium falciparum, of course, is the human malaria parasite that causes most of the malaria um, that affects Africa. Um, and this is really important because uh, it's an important technology platform. In fact, we are now uh, only about the fourth group in the world to actually have this model running. And it's really important for drug discovery, uh, particularly malaria, where it really, if you're looking at doing human dose predictions and looking at so-called thermokinetics, thermodynamics um, uh, studies, um, that you're really looking at the, the real human infection uh, in mice. And so this is a program, a platform we're using to support uh, a number of uh, drug discovery projects. All right, we have built up over the last uh, six or so years a range of partners representing the pharmaceutical industry, philanthropic organizations, not-for-profit virtual research and development entities, as well as a number of research institutions who are represented here. These also happen to be uh, our generous funders who fund our programs uh, for a long time. We're also um, in the TB arena. This is why this is in the little box here. Uh, we've been very, very privileged to be members of this TB Drug Accelerator, which is the largest consortium of people working together in early stage TB drug discovery. It comprises nine pharmaceutical companies whose logos are displayed here, and nine research institutions. And this is the University of Cape Town logo, um, and we are one of the nine research institutions. And a product development partnership the so-called TB Alliance, whose offices are in Wall Street, in the Trump building. <laughs> These companies here ordinarily would be competitors. But everything we do, in fact, last week I was in Washington for um, the first semi-annual meeting of the TBDA. We have two semi-annual meetings, one in the US, one outside the US. And everybody in this consortium shares information, shares data. It's complete transparency within the consortium. So these companies here would ordinarily be competitors, but they're not competitors. This is actually what we call pre-competitive drug discovery. So this really gives us um, another option to really access enormous resources over and above what we already have. These are local partners, uh, tremendous support from the South African government. Uh, and I wish that uh, every government would really prioritize research. Um, it's not a luxury. Uh, it really does contribute to, in many ways to a nation. Um, science councils and a number of uh, research institutions. All right, let me just take a step backwards and try to remind you where the journey really started. So I showed you in the previous slide three different technology platforms. The chemistry platform, the biology platform, and the pharmacology drug metabolism platform. That has been built over time. It didn't happen just suddenly. This was a picture in 2009. And this was born out of a discussion I had with Tim Wells, a very good friend of mine from MMV, of how could we use a project on malaria to help us build capacity, a track record and experience, so that one day we'll be able to replicate everything that we do with MMV. So in 2009, a year before H3D was founded, this was really just part of my academic group, the only thing that happened in my lab was chemistry. The other platforms, the biology, parastology, the DMPK, were all outsourced through the MMV partners. Now the point here is really important. It's about starting somewhere. Starting somewhere and building brick by brick. And the intention of the very beginning was that one day, the dream one day, was to replicate all of these platforms that were being outsourced so that we could have an integrated platform in the same institution to be able to prosecute projects. And that, in fact, became reality in 2012. And this is actually now the picture today, is that every single flag has been displaced. Every single flag, except this. This is still here, not for a scientific reason. 
for their chocolates, Swiss chocolates. <laughs> so this platform here really allows us to take a project from the lab. So this is the lab all the way to the clinic, first in man studies, all in one institution. That's a very strong value proposition. Take a project from the lab and put it into the clinic. And I'll show you just one highlight of how we've been able to do this from scratch. What are we doing uh, to share with uh, our colleagues and our friends and our brothers and sisters on the continent? We're doing this at several levels, but I'll give you just one example of how we're working with a pharmaceutical company with no strings attached to really contribute to capacity building. Back in 2013, end of 2012, there was an agreement signed between Novartis and the University of Cape Town. For the Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research, NIBRA, which is headquartered in the other Cambridge in the US, to work with H3D to bridge the gap between the basic sciences and clinical studies, to discover and develop innovative medicines that treat African patient populations. This agreement had a number of elements, and I don't want to go through everything. Let me just give you a couple of elements of this agreement. The first one was to build preclinical and clinical capabilities uh, with help of Novartis and experience from Novartis. The other aspect of the collaboration was staff exchange, capacity building staff exchange in both directions, and I'll come back to that later. The other element of the collaboration was to receive funding, very generous funding, from the Novartis Research Foundation, which is not a contract, but a donation. We've had it for the last five, six years now. And this funding is about building drug discovery capacity and expertise across the continent, using the infrastructure that we've created. And these are the elements of the collaboration. Um, this is really about uh, funding PhDs. Uh, PhDs, they could be in biochemistry. It's not about drug discovery here. This is about basic science uh, training, which then, of course, could be translated when people start doing drug discovery. Um, postdocs, funding sabbaticals, uh, and visits by, by experts. Just an example of how we're doing this in terms of some of the scientists that are benefiting from this arrangement. Uh, the one shown here. Uh, sorry, there's no Nigeria, but um, uh, at least... It's not just the Ghanaian mafia, um, it's also the Kenyan mafia. And I have to confess, standing here, I come from Zambia, so you can see I'm very objective. I'm very balanced. Um, there's no bias here. If anything, I have, you know, I have many, many weaknesses, um, but one of them I sent to Kevin Marsh earlier. I have many weaknesses. One of them is that I love Kenyans too much. That's a weakness uh, to have. Uh, so these are the people that we're funding, have been benefiting from the program, and they are all making use of the infrastructure that we've created uh, in various ways. And of course, this collectively, collectively is helping us not only identify new drug leads for the areas of interest that we're focused on, but also um, helping to deliver clinical candidates, and I will share with you uh, an example. It also really producing skilled scientists, skilled in integrated drug discovery, to understand the requirement for this or that discipline, pulling them together to solve a problem. And also, uh, really, really, an important aspect of this is producing leaders, scientific leaders that will lead because they know what it takes to do this. Just a very uh, quick highlight. Um, this is actually one of the uh, projects that we've done as an example. Uh, we have many, many projects that I can describe to you. It's a pipeline. It's not about one project. We have a portfolio of projects uh, within a particular disease area, a portfolio of projects at different stages uh, in the value chain. This is one example we did with uh, MMV and our partners here. This is a project that took a compound from a high-throughput screening campaign, optimized it to become a clinical candidate that's now going through human clinical trials, or using modern drug discovery approaches. And it was African-led. It was a partnership. Of course, it's a partnership. But it was led from Africa. Here's the highlight of this. I don't want to bore you with the details of this. So this is a compound that we led with our partners. It's an international partnership, 
just like Cambridge Africa. It's an international partnership. But the emphasis is that the discovery was led out of Africa. This represents actually the first small molecule to come out of Africa from a high throughput screening campaign, optimized to the clinic using modern drug discovery approaches. I won't bore you with the details of this. This was published um, uh, last year uh, in Science Translational Medicine. The other significant thing about this is that the early clinical development of this was also laid out of Africa, not just a discovery part of it. So the phase one human trials, which were done by Karen Burns uh, within the UCT Clinical Research Center, completed between that period, was also laid out of Africa. Again, very important for capacity building on the back of a project. So we've shown we can take something from the lab to the clinic in partnership, but providing leadership to an international effort. This compound then went to um, so-called volunteer or human challenge. Uh, this was done in Australia by James McCarthy uh, to really generate data that might support going forward with phase two, uh, which is much more expensive. And that, in fact, entered phase two trials in Africa last year. Let me go to my, my last slide. Um, and I really have to acknowledge, I think, when, when David uh, opened the meeting at the beginning, and the pro-vice chancellor uh, also opened the meeting. In fact, some of the points are here. I won't even dwell on them because they were really well articulated. In fact, I was very comforted uh, when I heard what David had to say. Uh, and I'll tell you what he said in case you have forgotten. And maybe he has forgotten himself about what he said. <laughs> um, and so this is the, um, the, really just something I thought about independently, but in fact, it's very much consistent with what the pro -Vice chancellor said this morning and what David Dunn said this morning as well. So first of all, infrastructure is a major challenge on the continent. I think we heard from Gordon's presentation, you know, you, infrastructure means a lot. It's not about just about a physical building or a functional laboratory. It goes all the way to include things like being, order, being able to order chemicals and receiving them in a good time. That's something people don't realize they take for granted. You know, I don't want to be carrying a suitcase like Gordon, um, but if you have to do it, you have to do it. So whatever recognizing that the responsibility to build infrastructure, the overall responsibility is really the home institution. But whatever we can do together to build infrastructure uh, is really going to help. Because without infrastructure, forget it. We wonder why we still don't have scientific leaders. We wonder why we still have not transformed the science landscape when you haven't given people infrastructure to do it and show what they can do. They are going to lag behind unless we create infrastructure. That is the foundation of everything else we do. You cannot attract projects without infrastructure. Second point um, is really an example uh, I think we've um, I've been very much part of for a long time now. And that is a program run by Novartis, known as the Novartis Next Generation Scientist Program, where they take scientists from Africa, South America, Russia, uh, and a few other places, take them to Basel uh, for about three months, um, and they get placed in different um, groups. These are typically PhD students, uh, but also clinicians. But the point about this, this program um, is that University of Basel has partnered with Novartis. So a component of what these NGS scientists do when they are there in Basel, in Switzerland, is to do something with University of Basel. Cambridge, you are surrounded by a number of spin-up companies here. They don't have to be pharmaceutical companies. Any company, I think that is one way to really, really immerse our students. They can really understand translational science. Uh, moving from basic science to translational science, you need both. And again, I don't want to emphasize the point. I think the next speaker, uh, Tom, will talk about AISA. But it's really, really important that we don't reinvent the wheel. We need to focus. We can't do everything in Africa. Zambia doesn't have to be part of everything. And Nigeria doesn't have to be part of everything as well. <laughs> we need to focus and do something and show it works. And then we can scale it. I think it's one mistake we make in Africa often is, if something is happening in South Africa, why is it not happening in Ghana? 
we want everything to happen, socialism or whatever, fairness, I don't know what you call it. It's really important that we don't dilute efforts because Africa has many challenges. Uh, we need to focus. Focus, and when we focus, we do something amazing. And when we do something amazing, the world takes notice and respects us. Um, this is really important. I believe that the best way to build capacity is to prosecute projects. On an ongoing basis, but when we do that, when we do that, and these are the, thing, the points, some of the thing, points that David and the Provost Chancellor attached on as well. So I'll be very quick uh, in some of these. But this one point is really to share the academic content in such a way that both the content and the technology is transferred to the African partner. And I think this was already mentioned by David, I think very well, and the Provost Chancellor. We can all learn from each other, so I don't want to labor the point because that point was made already. Um, Let's avoid a catch of dependency. And I think this point was made earlier as well. Let's not contribute to the brain drain. Now, one way to do it, I'm not saying that, you know, the brain drain, uh, if I start talking about the brain drain, I won't stop, but let me leave it here. Um, the point is, is, there are many reasons why this brain drain happens. I don't blame anybody that looks for an opportunity. As long as you're contributing to humanity, that's what is important. But if the governments of the day want to see their people back in their home countries, Give them the infrastructure. They're not asking for you to give them cash. They will find the cash, but please give them infrastructure. Why should they go back to Ghana if all they're going to do is fail to order chemicals? They have to wait for six months. How can they be competitive if they have to wait for six months for a reagent? All right, this is already mentioned already. David made this point about really focusing on local problems, so I won't labor that point. But the last one. Scient scientist to scientist mentorship, really important. Whether that happens on site or remotely, that has to be ongoing. Uh, this relationship should not just stop when somebody finishes with Caprix or Thrive or whatever programs. It must continue on an ongoing basis. The last point before I wrap up uh, a couple more slides is, unfortunately, there is a perception out there to think that South Africa's got everything. South Africa doesn't have everything. But South Africa has good infrastructure. And I think it's important to, for the funders, for whoever, to encourage these partnerships within Africa uh, because that's, that's how we're going to share expertise uh, and resources. That's the final slide, but let me just uh, quickly um, show you just two more slides and I'm done. These are just pictures. All right, when you do something, um, we can't, I can't demand respect, I have to earn it uh, by my actions on a consistent basis or, or whatever I say. But what we've been trying to do in a small way in Cape Town has not gone unnoticed. Um, and I think this is something I, I really call, the world takes notice. So this is actually 2009, the year before H3D was founded. And already this is a publication by the American Chemical Society, this is Chemical Engineering News. And it was this particular issue in May of 2009 the headline was Biotechnology in South Africa, um, here. And this was a recognition, you can see this guy here, he's from Ghana. Uh, recognition of the efforts that we're making to build brick by brick. 2009. 2013, this was a feature article in Nature Medicine. Okay, it says made in Africa. It's not juju, it's not witchcraft. It's a small molecule, made in Africa. Much more recently, um, this is actually um, after we build infrastructure, we build a track record, it attracts funding. Uh, and this was actually a press conference with the Gates Foundation to announce a major grant. Finally, this happened literally in the last uh, two weeks, less than two weeks ago. This was a Fortune magazine, 50 world's greatest leaders, 50 LWGA. The usual suspects uh, are on this list. Okay, so Bill Clinton uh, is the cover boy, and they're celebrities. There is also a scientist on this list, a scientist, and that scientist happens to be African <laughs> as well. Thank you very much. much for such an excellent talk and uh, congratulations. Um, time for one or two uh, questions. Sorry. 
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, Sebastian is my name. Um, I'm from Ghana, not Nigeria. So um, a quick question is, you mentioned diarrhea as one of the big five. Um, what exactly are you um, looking to um, do on diarrhea? Like what disease are you looking at? Yeah, so, we, so we're going after this gram-negative bacteria that cause uh, diarrhea diseases. So that's what we... No, no, just gram-negative bacteria. So TB is weakly gram-positive, and so this, so when people talk about antimicrobial resistance, AMR, it's effectively drug-resistant infections of bacterial origin, even though that's very broad, could include TB. Uh, but these are most of these hospital infections, and so we're focusing on some of these so-called escape pathogens, uh, including some that cause uh, diarrhea diseases. Um. Question from here, Stephen Kaptoga, University of Cambridge. I just wonder how much of your progress into a phase two trial quite quickly, more than the big giants could do, was because you had compounds already available, and that if you had started from scratch, how could you have selected your targets properly? So we actually began from scratch. So, so I guess very briefly, so when, you, when you're discovering drugs, so there are two approaches. One approach is to start with a non-target, so-called target-based drug discovery. So it could be an enzyme, uh, it could be a biochemical pathway, and then you find inhibitors to, to that uh, enzyme or biochemical pathway, and then you optimize the molecules for safety and efficacy, okay? So that's one approach, target-based drug discovery. The other approach is what we call phenotypic host cell screening, where you simply screen molecules directly on the cell. So in this case, it's screening a library directly on the malaria parasites without worrying or caring about how the drugs work, because we can figure that out later on. So all we did in this approach was to take a commercial library and screen that library of more than about 35,000 small molecules, screen them directly on the malaria parasites, screen the same library of mammalian cells, and focus on those molecules that were selectively killing the parasite without having normal cells. And then we go through what we know uh, as, as uh, optimizing those molecules for safety and efficacy. So that was the starting point. So do you have a feeling whether the drug will be affordable if it goes to phase three trial? One of the things that we do before starting drug discovery is to define what we call a target product profile. An example of a target product profile is that the drug should not cost more than a dollar per treatment. So that informs the chemistry we do and everything else we do to ensure that we really meet that target product profile. So yes, the ultimate goal for malaria uh, is to really come up with a treatment. I mean, it's not monotherapy, it has to be a combination that should not cost more than a dollar per treatment. And that is factored into the way we do the science. Thank you very much. I think if you could please save your questions for the um, uh, drink session afterwards, that would be fantastic. Thank you, yeah, thank you again sure. so much.